Welcome to Sports Spectrum, the sports and faith podcast that brings Jesus back into the conversation. Here's your host, Jason Romano. Welcome everyone to Sports Spectrum. My name is Jason Romano. It's great to have you tuning in and joining us here on the program today. Before we get started, I just want to share a little bit of a disclaimer with you about the subject matter that we're going to be talking about with our guest Trinae Gunzar today on the podcast. We're going to dive into sexual assault and sexual abuse uh, and the Larry Nasser case, if you remember that case from last year. And so I just want to give a little bit of a disclaimer. Some of this um, subject matter is um, it's somewhat mature. I'd, I'd say, you know, my daughter's 14 and I would let her listen to this podcast, this episode. But I would say if you have a daughter or a son under the age of 10 that normally listens to this podcast, maybe listen to it yourself first before letting your children listen to it just to be sure that you're okay. You know, we didn't go too heavy or too deep as far as uh, inappropriate language or anything like that. Uh, which I would never do on this podcast, but it does go into an area that we don't normally go into. And so I just want to prevent uh, present that disclaimer to you uh, before we start the podcast. And our guest today is Trine Gunzar, the former gymnast and longtime family friend of Dr. Larry Nasser. And Nasser, of course, was the former USA Gymnastics team doctor and physician at Michigan State that committed criminal acts of sexual assault that were the basis of the USA Gymnastics sex abuse scandal from the past few years, in which Larry was accused of molesting at least 250 girls and young women and one young man, including a number of well-known Olympic gymnasts dating as far back as 1992. And Trinae Gunzar was one of those gymnasts, and she came forward to share her emotional testimony back in January 2018 at Nasser's sentencing. And on January 24th, Nasser was sentenced to 40 to 175 years in prison for the sexual assault of a minor. And Trine, as I mentioned, was a longtime friend of Larry Nasser. And up until child pornography was found on his computer, Trine was a supporter. And Trine knew Nasser for 31 of the 37 years that she's been alive. And they were family friends. And it wasn't until she decided to come forward And along with that 20-minute speech on day four of the testimony that had Nasser shaking and crying almost the entire time, very emotional, Trine was emotional as well, that she came forward. And so on this episode of the podcast, I wanted to talk to Trine about her relationship with Nasser, Um, certainly her, her relationship with gymnastics and growing up when gymnastics started to take shape for her and when she began to realize something just wasn't right. With this man. Um, I also wanted to ask her about the powerful statement that she shared um, with Nasser present in the room and then becoming an advocate for sexual abuse, which she now does working with WC Safe, an organization that provides those affected by sexual assault with immediate and ongoing comprehensive services. And then I wanted to just close it with what she would like to see, what, kind of, what type of changes she would like to see with the USA Gymnastics Association, the USAG. So we wrestled with this type of an interview. We don't normally do interviews like this. I guess we do in the sense of going deeper into people's stories. Um, And some of them are very personal stories that they've walked through, but I've never done an interview like this. And I certainly have never had a, a conversation with anyone about this type of subject matter. But the opportunity was presented to us um, to have Trine on the program. And I always preach this. I always say this. If you have a story that you know you can tell and it will help someone, it might even help just one person, then you need to tell it. And if you have a story that you know you can share uh, and that person might be encouraged by it or be able to come to a place where they might be released or or come to a place of healing, then you got to share it. And so I believe this interview if one person listens to it that has gone through anything remotely close to what Trine and many of the other sister survivors have gone through, and it can help them enter a place of healing, enter a place of being more vulnerable, being uh, healed in, in some way, then we got to tell it. And that's why I feel so strong that this podcast is one that we needed to do. So let's get to our interview with Trine Gunzar, sister survivor and former gymnast here on the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Trinae, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. It's good to talk to you, Trinae. And let's start a little bit from the beginning with you and just share with our audience life 
growing up as a little kid and how you first got involved with gymnastics? Well, um, to be honest, I was doing flips off of our couch in our living room and <laughs> my mom decided that, uh, she was more concerned about the table getting broken. Um, so she enrolled me and at five years old, I, I never stopped. Wow. Started that early, five years old. Yep. yep. Now, she were was... you one of the gymnast types who were consistently, you know, in different practices and, and, and I don't know what you call them, I guess, meets and things like that as a kid, oh, yeah. were you constantly going to and from? Constantly. Yep. I think there was at one point I had eight week weekends in a row of competitions. So <laughs> It was a never ending, you know, it was four to five days a week of practice and then um, competitions every weekend. I think we had two weeks off during the summer where we weren't competing. Mm -hmm. And how long did that go through throughout teenage years as well into high school? And yep, into older? high school. Yep. I had, um, I had a surgery in my freshman year and that put me out for about six months, but um, wasn't short, shortly after that, that I was back in it. So... This is a faith in sports podcast, of course. So we like to dive into faith a little bit here. And let's just sure. ask you about what that was like for you as a kid. Was church or faith or any of that part of your life growing up? Yep. I was raised Catholic. So um, I spent many Sundays um, in church and we had lots of catechism classes. I feel like they were every Wednesday possibly or, you know, CCD is what we called it. Sure. Um, so you know, my dad's one of 11 and my mom's one of eight. So I grew up with a huge family wow. and I have family <laughs> members that are nuns. Okay. Um, so, you know, we, we always had a big faith growing up. Um, Sundays were definitely our, our day of rest in religion. So I, you know, I grew up with that and midnight mass every Christmas and Easter Sunday, you know, the whole nine. So what do those family reunions look like? That's a lot of people on both sides there. <laughs> it's And my husband's one of nine. Oh, so, geez. I mean, yeah, we actually decided for our wedding that we were going to try to make it as small as possible. So we did a destination and that in turn ended up with 120 people. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> that, oh was my a, gosh. that was small for us. So That's amazing. Well, that's incredible when you think about it because I know we have just one child. So we're a small family of three. Sure. And I, I, I know you just became a mom recently as well for the first time. Is that right? I did. Yes. I have a four month old today. And how is that going? <laughs> you know, my life this last year has been so crazy, but, um, becoming a mom has been such a beautiful experience for me. I, I was the oldest of 18 grandchildren on my mom's side. So I grew up raising children, right, um, right. but it's a totally different, uh, connection when it's your own. Absolutely. We're talking to yeah. Trine Gunzar here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. The story of Larry Nasser and the very public testimonies that so many, including yourself, shared were, were very difficult to watch, of course, but so important at the same time. Can you share a little bit about how you became connected with him and just where that relationship kind of started? Um, well, I went to Great Lakes at five years old, so um, he was our trainer. Um, but I didn't actually start seeing him as an athlete until I was about eight. Um, I was just a level five. I was a young little beginning competition gymnast. Um, and I was actually bucked off a horse um, mm. with one of my other teammates. And I dislocated my hip. And um, with that, that kind of started me seeing him. Um, because in gymnastics, you do a lot of straddles, straddle jumps, which is like a split sideways. Right. Um, and my hip would dislocate. So it was extremely painful, but it was a requirement in that level for, you know, different elements that we were competing. So I had to figure out how to get it better. And that's pretty much when my journey with him began. As the re relationship began to evolve, when, or, or did you even start to realize, certainly looking back now, we all know that, but looking back in, when you're in the moment, did you start to see something that was not normal or wasn't right or was not, is that kind of not how it was when you were younger? No, I mean, I was so little when it started. Um, and so because it started then for me, yeah. um, it was like normal. It was at every kind of meeting that I had with him, um, whether it was at his apartment or at Michigan state gym, um, the clinic or at gymnastics. So 
Um, you know, he fixed a lot of things for me, my wrists, my shins, my heels, my ankle, you know, there was a lot of things he fixed. Right. So I think when there is success with injury that he was capable of, of managing for us, that it's hard to question one treatment, even though it's, you know, vaginal. Let me ask you this. What loyalty is such a big thing in sports. I interview a lot of athletes and a lot of different people in the sports world and you hear about loyalty a lot. I wonder if loyalty was a factor in what took many years for so many to not only whether it was discover what was happening or sharing what was happening. Did loyalty have a lot to do with everything that kind of took place over the years and didn't really come out until the last few years? I mean, I think definitely it did, especially in gymnastics. There's, I mean, we were a family. Yeah. Um, and I think even now, some of my former teammates that I'm, you know, assuming have had this treatment because of their injuries that they had. Um, I think that there's a loyalty factor even still for some of them in the lack of ability to come forward or to kind of face this issue for themselves with him. Um and on the gymnastics level as well, I, th I think it's hard because he made it so far and he was so high ranked in our sport that, you know, you, you make an allegation of this kind and you think you're going to ruin someone's life. So I think that there was like a fear kind of instilled in us at a young age that maybe you don't necessarily just say something like this until you know for sure. But it's, you know, even the ones that did come forward back then that they were essentially proven that it was a medical treatment and that's why many didn't come forward after i think because they knew of those girls i know and i want to talk about the advocacy that you're involved with now and why you've mm -hmm. kind of made that such a priority and i love that about it but tell me about just the generality i guess of women coming forward and not having others believe them and it's taken so many of the women many years before they could come out and share what happened now looking back tell me why that is such a struggle to come forward and speak out. Can you share a little bit more on that? Yeah. I mean, you never want to, you think something happens, you feel something wrong is in your gut. Like you have an idea that something is wrong, mm. but you self doubt and you, you know, try to almost talk yourself out of something like that because you're thinking maybe I made this up or maybe I thought that this was wrong and maybe it's not. Um, so you, you do it to yourself initially in, in most circumstances. So on a coming out and going forward basis, you need to be confident within your own space that you feel this way and that you felt it was wrong to be able to tell someone else. Because if, if you do tell someone else and then they say to you, oh, well, that was medical or no, your intuition was wrong. You know, that there's a, a silencing aspect that happens and an in embarrassment that happens for you when you think that you were right about your initial feeling. And then someone tells you that you were not right. So, I mean, if you look at even like the Kavanaugh case, like for her coming forward, you see how much backlash she gets for something like that and yeah. on such a national stage. So for someone that maybe isn't that of that platform, but it's a family member that's doing this to you or a teacher or, you know, in most cases, it's someone close to you, someone that you know, someone your family knows. Right. So for you to have to make those kind of you know, allegations against that person, you really need to get to a space that you are completely confident. And then the first person you tell is the most important um, for you because they're either going to silence you or they're going to help you. And if it's your father's brother and you're having to tell your father that his brother is doing this to you, yeah. you know, there's a really fine line of, of fear and, and certainty that however this is going to come, come out of. And, and Larry was, it was different for you and your relationship with him because you guys were, he was a family friend as well, correct? Yes. So we, I was at his wedding. Um, we were very, very close. I knew his wife, I knew his children. I knew his wife before they were married. Um, so, you know, we, even still to this day, it's, it's hard for me to realize that it was him doing all this and has caused all this havoc for so many people because, it just, it never, it was never that person that you would have really, you know, looked at and thought, oh, he's a child molester. Right, right. Trené Gunzar joins us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. The moment you found yourself in front of him at the sentencing where you were so emotional and your statement was so very powerful, 
Take me back to the moment, maybe even the reason why you decided to speak out and preparing that statement and then having to deliver it. It's been almost a year uh, later now that that took place. Can you take us back to that? What was that like for you? Sure. Um, you know, I only decided to go public um, about two hours before I spoke. So wow. um, initially I had written my statement and it was very, very heartfelt. It was very kind and it was just kind of a broken heart moment for me yeah. of, of having to talk to him about this. Um, but once I started seeing the other girls come forward and have such a brave face to be able to speak in front of the media and to be able to speak in front of, you know, on a global stage, um, at all ages, I realized that it was really important for me to show them that I can stand with them and that I will stand with them. Um, so I had gone into court that day knowing I was possibly going to speak on that Friday. Um, and it was really when I saw Jordan Weaver speak, cause she is a, um, a teammate of mine. She's much younger than me, but you know, I knew that she coming forward, it was the first time she's an Olympian. I knew that her coming forward was really going to speak some, some loudness to our teammates to be yeah. able to come forward, but it was going to be the younger girls. So I knew that if I spoke publicly that I was going to reach the other age demographic of our gym. So I really wanted, and knowing that of my age demographic, we were with him five days a week versus one day a week. So I knew that these other ladies were going to be, uh, you know, would have been with him a much longer time frame. So I really wanted them to know that at least there was one of us that was speaking out because I was, I knew that they would be afraid to do that. Can you describe the emotion leading up to when you actually deliver? And I'm, fascinated by the way that it was two hours before you even knew that you were going to be speaking obviously it took you time to prepare that i would think because it was a 20 minute or so mm -hmm. speech that you gave i guess if you want to call it a speech but it was sure. 20 minutes so you had prepared that i, I presume beforehand or within I those did, two hours you know i started to i started to write my statement um probably that sunday so okay. the Sunday leading up to it. And I, I wrote many different drafts of it because I really had different emotions every day. Mm. And once the impact statement started happening, my feelings sort of changed. And, you know, I had, I had sent it to a couple of, of close confidants to me initially um, before this statement started. Um, and they were really worried because, you know, my level of love and compassion that I had for this person was very clear in my statement initially and they were you know worried that it would come across in a wrong fashion so i you know re just had to redive back into myself and just figure out what it is that i wanted to say to him and and why i wanted to say what i wanted to say um but it was extremely emotional it was probably one of the hardest weeks that i've ever had mm -hmm. um also i was pregnant so you know right. there's just all these feelings and emotions and thinking about your unborn child and just realizing I was so small and watching these little girls speak and just, you know, trying to remember back of how young that really started for me and, and how it felt really at this stage that this is who I was having to say, have this conversation with. Um, so it was pretty, it was pretty traumatic writing it. Um, and getting into that courtroom, I was really nervous to see him. I was mostly nervous for him to see me because I didn't want him to react to me seeing mm. me and I knew that he if he didn't react to me in some kind that he was probably already a dead person like his soul had already he had shut that part down yeah. um and so I s pretty much just hid in the back of the courtroom for the first half of the day because the Olympians were there and I knew that you know I was hoping that they would take the media attention but after I spoke and because I essentially broke him or you know he was hysterically sobbing yeah. during my statement as was I um I think that that was people's first real vision of him being human. Mm. And what, do you remember any emotions or, or thoughts immediately after you had finished sharing what you had to share? Yeah. I mean, I was still for me, like a lot of, of the other ladies, I know that them speaking out in court was kind of like a final and ending a closure. And for me, it was the beginning um, it really was the first time I was really saying that this was happening and this had happened. I hadn't told, I had maybe told my mom mm. and my husband and my sisters, but other than that, I hadn't told anyone. So this was really the beginning of, of me 
telling everyone that this hit, that I was in fact one of them and it was extremely emotional I I was probably in the darkest place I think I've ever been for the remaining two weeks after that hmm. um, because I really felt heartbroken I mean it was it was awful it was there's no way to ever explain what that was like other than it was extremely extremely dark when you're in that dark place are you first of all what helped you get out of it i guess and was there counseling and, and therapy and kind of things that you would think about after something like that that you kind of went through yeah you know i've never i've been in dark places you know you you have those times in your life that you just kind of have to go through sure, um sure. but this was by far the darkest and it was a space that I, I was unfamiliar with. I didn't know that I could go that dark, I guess. Mm. Um, and so that was very scary. And I think everyone close to me was on just high alert of like recognizing that I was not me for a second. Um, so counseling was really important. Um, but I was really hesitant to talk to a counselor. Um, not, not for for the act of speaking, but I was just not quite sure how I felt. All I knew is that I felt a little bit broken and damaged and just dark. I didn't want to, I didn't want people to recognize me. And I felt like everyone in the whole world had just seen me on television because my statement was shared everywhere. Mm. Um, and so it was kind of like a scary place for me to go into counseling, go into church, go into the grocery store, because I just felt like everyone knew who I was and kind of was just looking at me like that's her yeah I mean that's the thing though when you're thrust you're sort of thrust into the spotlight yeah because so many people I even just watching back your your testimony on on YouTube and you see how many views there are and I'm like wow, that's mm -hmm. a lot of people to know who you are yeah was there moments when you were like out in public or people rec like were you recognized oh, yeah. ever you were definitely huh? yeah yeah how did you um, deal with that it's like, again, like you said, I was just kind of thrown into this. Yeah. Um, I had people come up to me in grocery stores and parking lots and gas stations and just, you know, say thank you. Like there was never a, a moment where I was fearful. That's good. But it was a very emotional, you know, and people feel like they're, they're just thanking you because that's, you know, what they feel. But for me, it was almost every time it was at first when I was recognized, I was just, I would break out in tears and then I would almost, that's the part I was the most nervous about is I didn't want to make them feel a certain kind of way based on my reaction hmm. because I was sobbing. Right. So, yeah. So every time it's brought up, you're, you're, there's a trigger in you and it's like, so there's probably had to be a moment where you were just wishing, could somebody please stop saying something so I don't have to get emotional? Is that fair? Oh, yeah. I, in fact, there were, I would say, a good month that I avoided going out of my house. I avoided being anywhere. I mean, I would send my husband into the grocery store. I would send my mom to the store or go get me gas. Like, I just don't, I don't want to be seen. Yeah. I don't want people to see me. Mm. Tell me about faith at all, if they even played a part. I know we were talking and texting a little bit beforehand, and you mentioned how uh, maybe it wasn't as big of a, a part because you were such a dark place or whatever, but it, you say you went to church and, and just tell me faith at all. Is there, is that happening here? Are you thinking about faith? Is God, if, you know, are you angry at God through this? What What's kind of happening there? You know, I, you know, I've seen death and I've had friends that have had cancer and I feel like there's always a time when, you know, your confusion with God. Yeah plays in in part but i feel if anything i understood during this that god was kind of using me i i knew that i had to have a purpose and there was a reason that i was part of this or the reason that i was the person that broke him or I, there was a reason that my story was being shared so much i knew that there was a reason and and more and more and more i understand that i'm being used for a purpose so i don't feel angry at god i don't think i felt angry at God then, but I was confused mm. with, with God. I didn't understand, you know, how is this going to be good? How can there be something good come out of this? What is the good that came out of this? And what is the purpose that you're describing that purpose that maybe God has uh, planned for you? What is that? Well, I, you know, I work in a sexual assault advocacy program now, and, um, mm -hmm. I think that, 
I was always meant to be doing something like this. And, you know, I'm being asked to speak in a lot of places at, at this time. So it's, there's not been one single instance yet that I've finished speaking that someone hasn't come up to me with tears in their eyes and just say, thank you. You know, you've given me, you've given me a voice and mm. you've helped me find my voice. So, um, with that, I think that that's where my purpose is now is to make sure that others are heard and feel, feel like they can come to me if they need, or come to any of us if they need. A couple more questions with Trinae Gunzar on the podcast. So much of this show, this podcast that we do talks about faith, obviously, but forgiveness and repentance. Those are words that we hear a lot, especially in, in faith places in church. I wonder for you, if you could share, first of all, have you been able to forgive him? And if you could share what forgiveness in that process has been like for you? Yeah, you know, I have, I, I think during my statement, I told him I'm forgiving you yeah. and, you know, I pray for your soul. Um, and that was true because I don't, I'm sad and I'm angry in moments, but I don't wish bad things for him. And I don't hate him as a, a person of the Lord. Like I don't hate yeah. him and I don't want bad things to happen to him. So, um, I, I hope somewhere down the road that the person that I knew is still in him somewhere and that something good will be able to come from this for him. Um, yeah, I don't, I really, I don't want bad things to happen to anybody. So I, I don't think what he did was good and I, and I don't know how that happened to him to become that person, but I don't wish bad for him. What about in the people that you've worked with? I know certainly what you're doing is caring and, and providing support for survivors of sexual mm -hmm. assault. So has forgive forgiveness is a universal thing that we all struggle mm -hmm. with in my opinion, but what have you learned by hearing other people's stories about the difficulty of forgiving? And, and that word forgiveness. Well, I, you know, I think when you forgive is when you can finally let go and find a peace. And yeah. so my, you know, my hope is for everyone to be able to forgive and not forgive what he's done or forgive how many times he's done this, but forgive for themselves. Just let it go so that they can heal. Um, but I think that getting to that space is a really hard place because you have to go through some dark moments in your own self to be able to forgive somebody that's done something like this. So you have to be able to accept that you're going to have to go through those dark times to be able to get past it. And I think forgiveness is like that final letting go moment when you can finally just turn, turn away from it and start moving forward and healing, truly healing. Today, it's clear that the USAG and gymnastics has suffered tremendous damage in the aftermath of everything that took place. In your mind, what is the future of gymnastics? Is there any hope? And if so, what type of changes do you do you need to see? Do you want to see that, that need to take place? Well, I think that they need to put people in place that actually care about their athletes and want more for their athletes than just money and gold medals. So um, I, I think that there is hope for gymnastics. I think it's just going to be starting from the bottom and rebuilding and putting survivors in a place so that they can use their voice to help other athletes and making sure other athletes have a safe space to come forward when they're ready and when they need to, because the way that USAG has gone about it was almost exactly how you should go about it in every wrong aspect that you can as an organization. Mm -hmm. Same with Michigan state. They, they did everything wrong. So we have to learn from our mistakes and improve and make changes that are significant to, to rebuild. Trinae, last question. I really appreciate your time here and sharing sure. on the podcast. What's the biggest thing you've learned throughout this whole ordeal? Maybe it's something God has showed you. I know you t certainly mentioned having that purpose, uh, but what's the biggest thing that you've learned throughout all of this? Oh, gosh, that's such a loaded question, to be mm -hmm. honest, because there's so many things I've learned and they're all such different pieces of my story and my journey. Um, but I think for me, probably the biggest purpose or the biggest lesson that, that I've come from this is really trusting your gut. And, you know, if something feels wrong, it's because it probably is. 
and make sure that you have people around you that are lifting you up. Trinae Gunzar, I really appreciate you joining us here on the podcast. Thanks so much for your time. I wish you nothing but the best. Thanks so much. Many thanks to Trinae Gunzar for joining us here on the Sports Spectrum podcast. If you want to learn more about what Trinae is doing as an advocate for sexual assault, go to wcsafe.org, wcsafe.org, or you can go to her Twitter page at It's Trinae, I-T-S-T-R-I-N-E-A on Twitter and give her a follow there. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time with a new episode of the Sports Spectrum Podcast. Have a great rest of your day.